architecture is really the art and science of turning fiction into fact. Sometimes uh, kind of real architectural life interferes with intellectual architectural life. There is no such thing as architecture. Hello everyone, this is Vikram Prakash and you are listening to Architecture Talk. Each episode we try and have a conversation with a contemporary thinker to advance the frontier of architectural thinking, to help us imagine what the possibilities of architecture are in a way that is unusual. Today I'm speaking to Michael Benedict who is Professor of Architecture at UT Austin and who has written a series of books, all of which push the frontier of what it is that architecture can and cannot do. He's a challenging thinker and he combines an amazing mix of what one might consider to be extremely radical perspectives on the possibilities of architecture, including discussions of the sacred and the religious with very well-established traditional understandings of architecture. Together, he is trying to think of a new way for us to imagine and know what it is that architecture is, and therefore, by implication, what our role as architects should be as the makers of that kind of architecture. I hope you enjoy this conversation. Here we go. Doing this interview, I quickly tried to read my own book this morning. Oh, what's wrong with so you? That my, uh, so that, well, you know, life goes on and you start thinking about other things and it's like, you know, it's, it's, not, as, it's not as burning like a furnace in me like it was, you know, a year ago or six months ago. Uh-huh. I could have recited the book to you. Six months ago, you could have recited the book to me? Yeah, yeah. And, and now, now I read it and I just go, gosh, this is brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> Who wrote that? Who wrote this? Who wrote this fabulous book? <laughs> well, it raises that question and we can start getting into the sort of thick of the Okay, here. yeah. Uh, I mean, you talk about who is me and who writes. That mm-hmm. can be a question that can be asked. Mm-hmm. But uh, when, a, when a book is written, uh, who writes? And whether knowledge uh, like architecture uh, exists in a certain authorial realm or is really intersubjective, isn't it? Um, yeah. Well, you know, I've always uh, been of the notion that ideas come through you. Yeah. Uh, that one, everything depends on who you've been reading, who you've been listening to. Indeed. Where you went to school, who your friends were. Totally. Sometimes, sometimes friends you almost no longer remember put ideas yeah. into your head. And your parents. Oh, my God, your parents. Of course. I still wake up sometimes thinking, oh, my God, my father used to say that. Yes. My mother used to say that. And yes. I've built a career out of what my mother said to me when I was 14. Yes. <laughs> it's like, and, um, and, and they are all themselves, you know, have yes, other people exactly. speaking to them. So exactly, it's not like exactly. there is an originary person in your father or your professor yeah. or your friend. So, I, you know, when I read Derrida, I was very responsive to that, to the fact that, you know, there is no original text. Yes. That all texts are, are supplements to other texts and so forth. Right, right, right. And um, I certainly felt that in, I've written like, I don't know, eight books, maybe more if you can't edit it. Yes. And they're all channeling. They're all channeling other people. Yeah. And I often feel guilty, actually that I don't, do not pay enough respect to the people that have influenced, to the people that are actually represented. It seems like there's no, there's no amount of footnotes that can do justice to where, where you've... And at some point, as an existentialist, you just step up and say, well, you know, it's, I'm saying this, and if you want to refer to it, I'm going to be the authority for you. Mm-hmm. But it's not to say that others haven't been authorities for me. Yeah, we are standing. So think, we, we yeah, talk. so and I think each generation, you included, step into a certain responsibility, right? To to be to be an authority for the next generation. 
but you feel guilt about it. That's the one that idea that like, stays with me. Why well, because you... I can never say I can never say thank you enough. I mean, uh -huh. my footnotes would have to have footnotes, and my foot, and those footnotes would have to have footnotes. Uh huh. That's interesting. And there's also this, there's also the strange truth I think that often the people that we think of as great, you know, the Newtons and the Descartes and so forth. Whenever I read histories and biographies of this kind of people, you kind of go, well, you know, the person who really had that thought was this uh, unknown uh, teacher they had that no one ever heard of, right? you know, that actually came up with this. And, yeah. you know, the people that, that, that bring great ideas into the public realm are often not the people that actually, uh, actually invented them or brought them into, into being. Uh, and, hand, yeah, really, really. and it's not like somebody else. It's like there are these great ideas, and they are circulating and recirculating and regenerating in uh, new forms, uh, yeah. new grammars, new grammatologies, yes, uh, exactly, uh, new architectures. You know, which is, uh, I, mean, I mean, it seems yes. like you are roughly defining architecture as as kind of the same thing as a sort oh, of yes. a thing that exists. Uh, intersubjectively in that sense. Yes. Right. I mean, my book is a, is a post-human humanism. Right. Um, so I'm very uh, aware, as I read for it and wrote it and so forth, that of the formation of my ideas by humanist classical teachers, right? teachers of oh. classical architecture, and by humanisms of different kinds. Uh, and if I, I find myself in an era when humanism is in disrepute. Right. Because of post humanism. Right. But in my view, post humanism is still humanism. <laughs> or human post humanism, right? I mean, it's like. I like that too. That'll work. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, for us to turn around and say that trees matter and spiders matter and rivers matter is an entirely. It's a tribute to being human to be able to do that because rivers don't do it and spiders don't do it and animals don't do it. Humans do it. It's not bless oblige. It's like this is what we owe. Uh, yeah. We're not the only living things, and I yeah. think that's a triumph of humanistic thought. Yes, I mean the fascinating thing is it's a triumph that in part involves its own its own deconstruction. Perfect. Well said. Yeah, yeah. And that's the. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, I would say from my meditation practice, uh, that's not that different from the. Uh, teachings of uh, Buddhist practices. No, I agree. I would agree. It's a, in this particular case, I would, I used to uh, study and practice Zen, Zen Buddhism when I was in my uh, 20s and 30s. Uh, and that left quite a residue in me. But, you know, I also come from a, should we say a Talmudic tradition? And so when I when I read Derrida or did used to read Derrida, oh, a lot, sure, yeah, it was basically I don't know I don't know if you'd call it Buddhist exactly, Buddhist Talmudic that, Talmudic Buddhism, yes, yeah, yeah, it's like the the conversation never ends and it never had an beginning. Mm. Um, yeah, for sure, you know this whole idea yeah. of writing in the margins is Talmudic. There's no question. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So in the book, as you know, uh, in part one, which we're talking about, right. um, I'm a little critical of Buddhism. Mm -hmm. And maybe what I'm critical of, let's just say that's true, because there are many varieties of Buddhism, of course. is uh, the Western take on Buddhism, which is sort of fed into our uh, interest in self-development. I mean, uh -huh. Buddhism has become a, you know, a, a practice of self-improvement, Yes, uh, yes, practice yes. of uh, looking for equanimity, uh, you know, but it's really about making oneself a better person. And um, why should you be compassionate? Well, because you're a better person if you're compassionate, mm -hmm. which is a little sort of backwards yes. from a Talmudic point of view. You know, yes, like, that's no, right. no, no, no. The reason to be a person is so that you can be compassionate. Right. <laughs> you know, why be human? It's so that compassion can rule. 
it's a funny thing this whole sort of uh, mbaing of mindfulness oh yes yes exactly well put uh, and now we have the mbaing of uh, design thinking and we have the mbaing of all this uh, all this just about every people there yeah there are there are people who are not business people whose shelves are full of mba think mm. you know whose shelves are all about treating oneself as a business mm -hmm. like treating oneself as a business that uh, advertises and uh, that basic incorporation mm -hmm. yeah it's quite distressing all i mean in a sense i get a sense from this first part of your book that uh uh, that uh, architecture as this uh, kind of post-human humanism is uh, not just uh, a kind of uh, mindful presentist being intrasubjectivity, but indeed has the possibility of giving one access or enabling the possibility of something a bit more yeah, something sacred, perhaps. So you you use the term sacred. You use many terms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, um, I do use the term. I, I think you know, part one starts with a, a commentary on the importance of the idea of sacred space and the observation that that um, I think architects are in the are in the business, quote unquote, of manufacturing sacred space. Mm. Uh, you can make sacred space for commercial reasons. You can make sacred space for uh, religious reasons, mm -hmm. but that we use all the cliches, if you will, of sacrality, tall spaces, mysterious light, extreme cleanliness, uh, sublime simplicity. And there's all sorts of gestures we make in all buildings that, that are echoes of our sort of religious beliefs, but those tend to, um, they tend to fall on the same sort of sky god metaphor that God is in the sky, God is in the sun and the clouds and the stars, mm -hmm. and that architecture is what brings that down to earth. And there's, you know, and then you can cite Heidegger about, you know, clearings in the forest and the uh, humans under the gods and so forth. So it's not like there's no tradition, uh, probably from, from Greek tradition. But my book points out the other tradition, which um, seeks divinity in uh, communality, shall we say it, or in uh, relationships, or if you're Christian in uh, the Gospel of John, that uh, God is love mm. and that God is uh, imminent. So the notion that that divinity inheres in the relations between people I would say also the relations between people and animals, plants. And now that's part that I think I contribute is that that idea can also apply to buildings themselves, uh, quite apart from people, which is to say, let's say relationships between rooms. Right. I'm, partic I'm particularly fascinated in inter-room relations. Mm -hmm. And uh, I look to Khan for uh, examples yes, of that. Absolutely. Yeah, no, no, Kant definitely, you know, believed in uh, in that uh, eventing, if you like, uh, or that happening. And I think that's a fantastic possibility. And then that, that's the post-human in the post-human humanism. Yes, right? very good. Exactly. Yeah. To admit to that uh, possibility and to recognize that it's been uh, there for a, for, a, for a long time. And that when uh, Khan spoke of our stewardship and responsibility to that, it was not an authorial gesture of taking control or sort of genesis of birthing something. It's like, it's like you know, let's not make sure that uh, if there is some kind of a conversation amongst rooms, we don't screw it up to begin with yeah well you know a plan is a society of rooms he said mm, he did and uh that's a trouble with khan he was actually very very serious when he said these things but he's he's more or less maybe that's going to be true of all pronouncements by architects you know if they're thought of as just uh serving a style like you'll say anything to make the way you do buildings look better but i think well, he really really meant it that, uh, if a plan is a society of rooms that means all the categories that apply to social organization actually apply to buildings. 
a building is a social organization. Um, and in you know, parts two and three of the book, we really sort of go into it. I mean, I come off the, at this, some of this from a very, uh, you know, simple physics perspective as well, which is that, of course, it, it, they are. I mean, mm -hmm. there is order everywhere in the universe. And there are things yeah. uh, doing their stuff everywhere all the time and having organizations and relationships and fights and exchanges and energy differentiations. There's stuff going mm. on everywhere all the time. Vikram, you're a teacher of architecture, are you not? <laughs> I am, I am. <laughs> and uh, how often do you hear students being able to operate at that level? Yeah, no, no, no. How, how, how often members of, the, of our profession operate at that level? No, I know. Yeah. You're right, you're right. I mean, we, and, and we push in the studio this whole idea of, you know, be or express yourself. Uh, There's no right or wrong here. There's just, you know, the integrity of your idea. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and how you bring it up. But, you know, uh, since I've, you know, in the last, especially the last few years, but really pretty much all my career, I try to convey to students that, you know, that if you put two chairs in a room, they're, they're already in conversation even when you leave the room. Those two, bookcase, those two bookcases behind you, I guarantee you have feelings about each other. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, that reminds me of the, you remember, <laughs> delirious, the new drawings in Delirious New York? Uh, yes, yes, exactly. Uh, uh, Rem didn't do that. His I mean, that's what's funny is that when you, when you go the animist route and you say, listen, everything has a life, or if you go tr uh, triple O, object-oriented ontology, yeah. which is another, another manifestation of this idea. Hmm. Um, for architects, it's a dangerous path because it's easy to trivialize and to turn into cartooning. Of course, of course, yeah. Like if you read Learning from Las Vegas and, you know, the early postmodernists, yeah. Charles Jenks, they, they, they tapped into this. They knew that buildings are like beings and that they have a life, but it very quickly degenerated into a cartoon. Mm -hmm, it did. And that's the, the amazing thing about Khan is he used an extremely austere language of you know, construction and form and geometry. I think deliberately to, risk, to not allow the, the shapes of architecture to turn into illustrations comic book illustrations. You want a building to feel like a dinosaur, act like a dinosaur, but not look like a dinosaur. You have to sort of go to the essence of dinosaur somehow, because a building is a building is a building. It's not a picture of something else. And uh, that's always the hard thing to convey as a design teacher. It is. You, how do I know the difference between a cartoon and a conversation? Well, you know, uh, Vikram, you probably have your own your own ways of getting to that point. And, you know, my hope is that my book sort of reopens that conversation mm -hmm. uh, right. and and points to some very great architects that have that have managed to give life to buildings themselves, give life to rooms, give life to objects um, and step aside and let those let those beings be in divine relation to each other and not always make it about your experience. One of the things I have been into uh, recently, the last few years is uh, fashion. The idea of uh, clothing as, uh, as architecture. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, but of course, fashion suffers from a ancient, or rather not, not an ancient, really a modernist, mm -hmm deprivileging and you know sexism we we, we suffer under that uh well uh, there's there's something similar to i've always thought there's a parallel between you know putting on a coat and just feeling feeling yourself in the coat and mm -hmm. maybe stepping in front of a mirror and just sort of you know brushing yourself just making sure that it's sitting on your shoulders right and you feel the coat making you into a different person than you were without the coat. Yeah. You know, um, and, and, and the make the parallel between that and walking into a building that when you walk into a building, you sort of put the building on. Yeah, like you do. You open the doors, they close behind you and you've put on a coat 
you've put on the building. Yeah. And now your whole being is represented by the building. The building is now the outside of you. And the same with every room. So I think the, the parallel is, is quite, quite profound. And I don't know that that necessarily takes you into a conversation about fashion, right? I mean, there's, there's a way to talk about clothing without going, okay, you know, this year it's stripes, next year it's uh, dots. You know? Oh, no, I mean, I mean, that's an industry. I mean, we can, in a discussion of architecture doesn't take us into a, necessarily into a discussion of real estate, right? I mean, that's the same. Yeah, 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 right. You know, of course, architecture yeah, yeah. is real estate, but there is architecture and then there is real estate. Similarly, there is fashion right. and then there is the fashion industry, right. uh, you know. And I think even in the fashion world, there are personalities, the great fashion designers were actually not as trivial as we make them out to be. I think they were very deeply, very deeply understood what clothing is and what clothing does. And I think that's the same is true in dance in all the, all the sort of the expressive arts is that the, uh, the, the pioneers in them were not shallow individuals. They well, I, I would argue, uh, Michael, that uh, unlike our shallow postmodern intutors of the 70s and 80s in architecture, mm -hmm. uh, I believe some of the other arts actually did a much better job of carrying that intuition of postmodernism mm -hmm. uh, into much higher uh, uh, expression, particularly yeah. in fashion. And yeah. I am obsessed with the work of Alexander McQueen. Uh, you know, oh, film. yes. Yeah, yeah. And I think, I think you know. he got it. He, he had it. And mm -hmm. um, I'm, the book that I'm working on for uh, next year, is on the life and work of Alexander McQueen as architecture. And I think that uh, the shows that he put up and not the line, you know, that came out of them, the line's mm -hmm. great too, uh, but the shows that he put up uh, are, are profound readings of uh, uh, post-human humanism, let's put it in your mm -hmm. lexicon. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, anyway. And I think there are similar, there are parallels also with, aside from, fashionability that the thing that changes every few years which i think is where everyone's mind goes to when you talk about fashion yes. there's also a strange um magic of uh, quality do you know like uh the the 200 or 300 dollar black t-shirt which ma makes most people just like giggle mm. like, what kind of fool would spend 200 dollars on a on a black t-shirt right what kind of fool would spend you know, a thousand dollars on a jacket. Yeah. Um, it becomes sort of laughable, and and until you yourself pick up a two hundred dollar t shirt and feel it in your hands, you yourself put on the thousand dollar jacket and look in the mirror, and go, or just touch it with your hands and go, oh my god, I didn't know a jacket could do this. Yeah. You know. Yeah, and I think architects are the same way. It's like, what? A thousand dollars a square feet, a square foot. What are you talking about? <laughs> Two thousand dollars a square foot, and you go, yeah, yeah. And uh, if you if you spend that with a good architect, you're gonna feel it the rest of your life, and you'll know it. Yes, yes. Every dollar will speak to you. Yes, um, yes. There you go. Yeah. The, the 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 best designers, fashion designers, are our first cousins. You know, yeah. they are in the business of in, inhabiting, building an in habitat for the body. Yeah. Not in the, you know, uh, Heideggerian sense, I'm in, in the sense that you're talking about. Yeah. So I think architects are constantly in the business of defending refinement or defending connoisseurship mm. or defending fine points, defending budgets. Like, why? Why would you want to spend that much when you can do it? much more simply, you know, using this or that convention of construction. Formula, form follows function and utilitarianism. Have yeah, yeah. these things done us disservice to that extent? Oh, for sure. It's, uh, it's called uh, Gresham's Law. Uh, the Earl of Gresham, I mean, he was like 1750 or 60. He, yeah, he was the finance minister to Queen Elizabeth I. And he invented a law called Gresham's Law. And it said, Gresham's Law says, 
uh, bad money drives out good money. <laughs> okay. And the reason bad money drives out good money is uh, because the value of money is in what people think it is and not what it actually is. Mm. And so a silver dollar is worth a dollar and a gold dollar is worth a dollar, but gold is worth more than silver. Mm. And so in the history of currency, countries would continually uh, reprint their currency or remint their currency in cheaper and cheaper metals, right. which, would enable, which will enable them to print money. <laughs> so so the, uh, the, the metaphor is, you know, any, between any two products, if you can't tell the difference in quality, you will buy the cheaper of the two. If two things look equal in quality to you, you will buy the cheaper. That sets up a dynamic where, where the presentation of quality is not the same as the existence of quality. So you might have a car with um, leather upholstery, but it's actually only the seat is leather, but the back is plastic. Or you might um, clear cut a forest all the way to a highway, but then leave a hundred feet of trees. Yes. The idea is that if you drive along the road or you see trees and you don't realize it's being clear cut all the way to a hundred feet like that. Mm. So it's kind of value engineering. You just go to where the value is perceptible and then you drain the rest uh, because it's costing you money. So there's a sense in which architects need constantly to, to say why quality is worth the money. Right. Yeah, and in that sense, they have been uh, disserviced by their uh, alliance to, I would say, the art world, because they have, we have been sort of produced as artists who kind of uh, are to be thought of as misunderstood uh, individuals uh, and mm -hmm. items for uh, for the rich and famous. Uh, rather, yeah. well, it's also we're also priests, and, and also the cult of experientialism, uh, Vikram. Yeah, yeah. Is like, uh, the experience is always of surfaces. The experience is always of the outermost shell of things. Yes, and if you keep focusing on that, then there's nothing necessarily behind it. Mm. There's you know, the first lick of the ice cream is all that counts. Right. Um, so, and I think architects, insofar as they cast themselves, and you know this is in the book, the experience economy, insofar as architects join the experience economy and see themselves as kind of entertainers with buildings, then, you know, you're going to find cheaper and cheaper versions well, coming to the fore by, by Gresham's law. Yeah. Versus, uh, versus uh, priests of the sacred. Uh, yes. And, um, you know, I, I hesitate to say architects should be priests or rabbis or, or mullahs or whatever. I think that's probably a very, very bad idea from a PR point of view. But I think um, if you look at the quote unquote great architects, they were. Mm. Indeed, exactly those things. Frank Lloyd Wright was, everyone is, even Frank Gehry, who was a very, very down-to-earth guy yeah. uh, and would, would shrug off any sense of his own sacrality, if you will, mm. um, you know, puts forward the value of uh, conviviality as his yeah. supreme value. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And conviviality is, in fact, a sacred notion. God yeah. is life and God is love, yeah. Ah, so you're defining love as conviviality. Yes, it's the same thing. Interesting. Conviviality, right? Living with. Living with. Mm -hmm. Is that, of course I like that John's, uh, is that uh, the sacred idea in the Bible of love that you were talking about? I think so. It's related. Let's, I don't want to split hairs here. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. If you believe God is love, uh, then you believe that the association between living things uh, is the substance of God. Mm. The word for self in Sanskrit is Atman, A-T-M-A-N, which is cognate with the Greek atmos, mm -hmm. from which we get atmosphere. 
yeah. Atman as self uh, rather than the Abrahamic idea of a deep interiority, which is, you know, uh, the presence of divine uh, who is at an infinite distance and yet within you, Atman as self is uh, atmosphere, which is that which surrounds you. Mm -hmm. And to breathe is to be soul. Yeah, soul, soul is around all around you. In Hebrew, that would be Nishama. Nishama. Which is Nishama. Mm -hmm. That is, um, it's the, uh, the identification of the divine with uh, wind or breath. You're right. So you breathe life, God, you know, in Genesis 2, God breathes life into, into Adam. Yes. So, you, you know, the identification of breath with life is, I think, probably present in, in many religious traditions. Right. And in the Garden of Eden, God arrives as a wind. Uh, when, uh, when Moses demands to see God, God says, okay, you can see me, but only, only, only in passing. Mm -hmm. So Moses puts himself in a rock and God sweeps by him and yeah. he feels the wind of him having passed. But he never sees God face to face. You can't see God face to face. You can only feel God's passing. Mm. God's exiting the scene. Mm -hmm. Like a person, like a breeze that, that comes through. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think I feel like that's a more metaphoric use uh, in there. Oh, no, sure. Yeah. Uh, versus... But, you know, it comes, it comes up for me anyway. Like, okay, to, let's bring it to architecture. Yeah, yeah. I'm giving a project uh, now in my studio called, uh, it's a summer school. It's a school that's open in, only open in the summer. I won't go into details. Mm -hmm. And it's here in Texas, which as you know, is, hot, is very, very hot. Yeah, yeah. But I'm not, I'm not allowing the students to use air conditioning. Fabulous. So we're thinking of ways to be tolerably uh, cool, uh, pre-air conditioning. And, but the implications are actually amazing. And the students are finding it quite difficult. Why? Because, well, because you can't just use blank sheets of glass and you can't just drop, drop ceilings and thread, uh, thread um, you know, ducts through. I mean, really, a building with air conditioning is like a patient on life support. Of course. You know, of course. With uh, tubes going up its nose. So piping icy air all around the place has all kinds of implications. It means that you have to have uh, completely sealed windows, which yeah. turns your building into a kind of an aquarium or a terrarium that just happens to be full of chilled air. And so we have, you know, buildings that are basically like refrigerators, especially here in Texas. So, but here's, but the point is, I'm trying to get it around to the spiritual side of this, quite frankly. Yeah. So the students are designing, now they have to do windows that open. Mm. They have to do shutters. They have to do things that slide, things that have awnings. We are, they're doing evaporative cooling, which means sort of like misting pipes yeah, or yeah. gigantic panels with water dripping over the metal. Right. Uh, four foot, five foot, six foot uh, radius uh, fans that are making the whole building a duct. Instead of being a box with little chill, chilling ducts, yeah, yeah. to actually make the whole building breathe. And part of my motivation is, oh, let's save energy. Let's say it's not really about sustainability. It's really about being in a building where the air is moving in a human way. Right. And, um, and I've been in buildings like that occasionally. Um, and evaporative cooling is just a marvel. But the point is, I guess, in the context of our discussion, the point is that... Um, not only does that kind of building look a little different, it feels bodily different. It is a different kind of building. And it makes a different society in, or social, it, and it makes a different kind of, right. different kind of conviviality. Yes. Does yeah, it well said. And, and especially if you make that final identification, which I have actually very, very gently done with my students, 
that uh, self is Atman or that God is breath. And you start realizing, yeah, air movement is more than just about physical comfort. Air movement is about a sort of a spiritual comfort. Mm -hmm. um, and there's something about wind, wind in the trees that's different to, you know, no trees, no wind. Yeah. I mean, these things are very, very affecting. Mm -hmm. And it's the same, the same architect's absolute abhorrence of curtains and any kind of fabric, mm -hmm. right? That oh. actually curtains and fabrics are the first thing that move when yeah. there's air movement. Yeah, yeah. And pe people will tie ribbons to air conditioning ducts just to prove that they're blowing. Right. <laughs> and um, I, you, you get the point, it's, there's like a domino effect, yeah. Well, I grew up uh, in a non-air conditioned, extremely hot, 110 degrees every day culture. Yeah. Yes. Where was that, Vikram? A uh, place called Chandigarh in North India. Uh, of course, I know Chandigarh. So, uh, so we grew up and Chandigarh was designed, you know, it, there was no money and there was no air conditioning anywhere. Uh, only the interior chamber of the assembly building was air conditioned. Nothing else was air conditioned. And we just grew up with that. And evaporative coolers came in the 70s. Uh, and um, air conditioning really kicked in only with globalization in the 90s. It was ubiquitous unit, unit air conditioners everywhere now. Oh, the unit air conditioners, right. Yeah. Well, you know, the, 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 the great, the good thing about unit air conditioners, I, I really do not actually like them because they're so noisy. Yeah. But the nice thing about them is that the air comes from the window. Mm. That is, they're usually slipped into window openings. And so at least they get something right. And the thing they get right is that the air comes from where the light comes from, that the air sort of comes from the window. Right. right. So I'm, I'm pretty sure that there are better ways to do air conditioning, even if you're air conditioning. For example, you could duct the room so that, and I'm admitting that there's ducts now, uh, but you could duct the room so that the air came from the windows mm. that the, that the, there was on the one the perimeter, or that you could design for not not to put duct work into a building, but to treat the whole building as a duct. Mm. So you introduce a gigantic um, fan on one side of a building, mm. and you introduce uh, pressurized walls, like perforated walls on the other, mm. and the whole all breathes and a gentle breeze comes through the entire building right right when you op open and close your doors you feel a slight pressure yeah push back because there's air moving in the buildings yeah in other words i really think the buildings could breathe and have coherent airflow yeah but right yeah. now architects just they just design a, a building as best they can and then hand it over to the to the uh, air conditioning people and they size the ducts and you're done and then they place them all over the place same goes for lighting yeah. you know i mean yes. you know yeah. lights. i hate this whole business of cans in the roof which are distributed everywhere so that yeah. every place can be evenly lit i mean it's thoughtless God, it's mindless it's 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 not it's mind it, it it's 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 more than mindless it is uh, <laughs> it is it kills you yeah you know? There's a Especially of... if you're raised like you were, and more or less as I was. <laughs> but you've got to understand, I, you know, and I think we both appreciate that, you know, the generations have be, have grown up with the um, fluorescent light, eight foot ceiling, air conditioned, everything as the default. Mm. Like that's 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 normal, right? So any attempt to like change that. Uh, is is thought of as a sort of deviant in a way or retro yeah or you know like you know maybe you like retro motorcycles you would just have to you know say yeah we're going back in time because it's so much fun to do that um i think it's very it's very crucial how how one presents and markets um any sort of reconsideration of air and light in buildings Mm -hmm. without mm -hmm. making it romantic without making it like it's got to be new yeah it can't be old 
Let's talk about growing up since you brought it up. So South mm -hmm. Africa, Johannesburg, Joburg, where were where you? Johannesburg, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I was, I was born in Australia. So oh. I actually spent my first six years in Adelaide. Wow. Um, but no, I grew up, I went to uh, undergraduate school in Johannesburg. Mm -hmm. Wits, I've been to Wits. I, 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 yeah? Yeah, yeah. I, in fact, even oh, cool. visited Wits um, even before uh, 90, uh, uh, you know, before in, 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 the, in the last years of apartheid even. even the, yeah. Did you meet Pancho Geddes? No, I did not. Ah, okay. Yeah. He might have left by then. Yeah. yeah. A, a wonderful uh, Portuguese architect. Uh -huh. had, had influence. Uh, do you stay in, uh, are you still connected to the South African sort of architectural academic uh, firmament? You know, um, a lot of, because my, my education was there and there was a tremendous interest in um, what it meant to be authentic, authentic architecture. Several of my teachers had worked for Louis Kahn and came back to teach. So Kahn's influence really started quite early for mm. me and also for Stan Seitowitz. Do you know Stanley? Yes, 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 yeah, yeah. Is there something to, you know, uh, you are teaching, you know, in the United States now, I have been for a long time. This whole business of, you know, I keep thinking, you know, Derrida started in Algiers, you know, Julia Kristeva started somewhere. Uh, you know, so many people, uh, is there something, do you feel like, uh, was it just an accident that you happened to have all this sort of uh, experiences growing up in a certain kind of education that has stayed with you? It's just an accident. It could have been anything anywhere. Or is there something to this sort of journey and being placed here uh, and that distance of having traveled and uh, left behind uh, a place that uh, plays into uh, one's life late, you know, even years on. I th yes, I think so. And I think it's probably true for you. And uh, gosh, how many South American architects have, have yeah. Uh, yeah. raised into the firmament of uh, uh, great American designers? Um, I think we all bring our childhoods with us, especially architects. I think your architectural sensibilities are formed quite young. Yeah, uh, places you played as a five and six year old. Yeah. Uh, the streets you grew up on, the smells, the yeah. quality of light. Yeah. Um, you know, the places you rode your bicycles around. Yeah. Uh, the weather, the smells. I do, I do think that stays with you. And it does. I think to a certain extent, as a grown designer, part of you is trying to return. Part of you is trying to go back home. Mm. Um, like I believe the latitude you grew up at makes a huge difference. Mm. Like I think you're probably living at a much more northerly latitude than you were raised at. It's killing me, Michael. Yeah. I need to move down to Phoenix. Yeah, well, one of, one of the reasons, aside from the fact that the colors are different and the green of the trees is different, yeah, and it rains so much where you are, <laughs> um, but part of it is simply uh, simple stuff, I think, like day length. Mm. Like when you grow up, and it doesn't really matter now north or south, but there's a certain distance from the equator, which the, the length of the day in the summer, the length of the day in the winter, um, these things are deeply in your biorhythms. Yeah, I can I think believe if, that. If you move, yeah. yeah, if you move to a place where the nights are too long and the winters are too long, or the days are too long. Oh my God, I remember going uh, living in uh, Europe for a while in Stockholm in the midsummer. And basically it was like late afternoon at midnight. <laughs> and by <laughs> two o'clock it was like morning again. <laughs> it, was, it was just too much for me. Anyway, but it's, I, but it's, but it's a double-edged thing, isn't it, Michael? Uh, we are yeah. also running away, aren't we? I mean, you're probably running away from apartheid South Africa. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's that's what made me come. I, I had the choice of being a a big fish in a small sea, 
in a small and unjust sea uh, or being a small fish in a big sea. And um, I come into America more or less guaranteed I'd be a small fish. It, when I, in no, no. South Africa, I was already, I had all, a bit of a reputation already and an offer of a partnership in a firm and so forth. So, you know, I took the other, took the other route. Um, but yeah, I have, mem I have memories and feelings and attitudes about places that are probably South African, privileged, by the way, white South African. Yeah. Of course, yeah. And I think you carry uh, India with you. I do. And, I, I, and I, I have to hope that our students benefit by that. Yeah, I, I, I think so. I hope so. Uh, and for a while, I tried to do that almost sort of directly by running a series of studios in Chandigarh. But, you I know, I also think of uh, my children and, uh, you know, how, what is it? It's difficult to know how to offer that benefit, I guess, uh, other than it just happens. Or perhaps the better way is that it just osmoses its way through. Well, you know, um, there are parts of my work that are, there are lots of things I um, kind of go by a little bit rapidly because, you know, the book's a finite thing. But um, I try as a designer, and more as an academic really, to um, find the science of place. Like what is it that makes, gives a place its um, geographic specificity, right? So I've not written about this in particular, but I, I should, probably should someday. The color of green at different latitudes and different uh, ecological zones produce a different uh, spectrum of green. In the north, where you are, it's a deeper bluer green that most plants are. Ooh. Here in Texas, the, all the greens are yellow. Uh -huh, yeah. yellow green, brown greens. If someone shows me a picture, like in a movie, I can tell you within three seconds that that was filmed, you know probably in Texas, more or less where, and it's instant, uh, the, the light and the sky and so forth. I'm not as good as recognizing places filmed elsewhere. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but there's something, and I, I don't think that's mysterious in the religious sense. It's mysterious only because no one stopped to ask, what are the components of this? Mm average height of trees, average spacing of trees, spectral composition of, uh, of leaves, um, color of rocks, uh, right? Uh, basic geology, um, percent sky cover, uh, all this kind of, I know that kind of makes it geeky, mm. but, I do be, but I do believe that those things sort of add up to what architects say Oh yeah, you know, it's the quality of light. And whenever an architect says that word, it's the quality of the light. I it, it makes me say, well, okay, gimme, give gimme, give tell me. <laughs> right. What, what is that what does that consist in? Mm. And of course, you just draw a blank because no one knows what the quality of light really consists in. Right. So and that brings out the the scientist in me. There are other things like the boundaries between sun and shade. Architects will talk, talk, tell you about shade and they'll tell you about shadows. But in fact, there's a surface between the volume of shade and the volume of sun. Ooh. And that's an invisible surface. Ooh, right. And, and things happen when you break that surface. When a human being's body crosses from sun into shade or objects, trucks, cars, buildings mm. uh, are intersected yeah. by the sun shade boundary. And this happens under very specific circumstances having to do with latitude and sunshine. And you can design for it. Right, indeed. Aging, yes. I'm talking about the other end of the spectrum, uh, you know, uh, in this sort of interactive world, the world and mind, uh, and uh, relationality of architecture, uh, architecture as relationality, uh, and the sort of presence and the long presences that stay with us, you know, how does one, 
how in this thinking uh, do we prepare for the end of life? You know, I'm not sure I have anything particularly wise to say about that. I mean, I, I do think that part of the reason architects become architects is because their work outlasts them. I sometimes, I don't even worry exactly, but I sort of go, you know, musicians, musicians have to live in the moment because their, their art disappears the minute the minute it's performed. I mean, you can record it, which is good. But most of the other arts are very, very sort of episodic and can't be expected to be, I mean, you can archive them, but you really sort of nearly always had to be there. You have to be there at a performance. You have to be there at, a, at certain moments. Um, and that sculpture, I suppose, but architecture especially has this um, bid on eternity. Mm. And I, I've noticed that different architects feel differently about that. A lot of architects will say, I never think about that. Other architects will say, actually, you know what? Today, buildings don't last very long. You know, 30 or 40 years, like a human lifetime is all you can expect from a building. Right. It'll pro probably be torn, torn down and built again. So don't invest in ideas of eternity. And I think a lot of architects look at Khan and think that that's a little bit of a um, obsessive uh, worry about lasting centuries and ages and so forth. Mm. Um, my own feeling is that if architects stopped and thought about it a little bit, probably one of their choices, the reasons they chose the profession was their own sense of temporality and the fact that when they're gone, they'll still, they'll still be here somehow. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think that that's definitely, well, uh, a force that play. Well, sure. you know, you've heard the phrase, uh, a thing of beauty is a joy forever. But I've also heard the inevitable trajectory of all architecture is ruin. Is ruin, yeah. yeah. Well, listen, you know, there's time and there's time. There's hundreds of years and there's thousands of years and then there's tens of thousands of years. So, I don't know. And when it comes to immortality, I'd be happy with uh, another 20. <laughs> <laughs> May my buildings last 20 years longer than me. It's like <laughs> sort of a modest, a modest request. <laughs> modest request. <laughs> <laughs> That's really funny, Michael. Um, hey, it's been such great time to have this conversation with you. Thank you for listening to Architecture Talk. This is your producer, Amelia Jarvanen. We hope you enjoyed the conversation. And if you did, please subscribe and rate us on iTunes or Spotify. We would also love to hear from you if you have any suggestions on new topics or guests. You can always reach out to us on our website, Facebook, or Instagram. Thanks again. And until next time, this is Architecture Talk.